Hi, uh, my name is Carl Levin, and I'm 85 years old. And uh, I used to be a U.S. Senator for 36 years, representing Michigan. Well, my father, uh, Saul Levin, was one of eight children, and um, he, uh, Joseph and Ida were the parents. They had come from Europe, and uh, they originally um, went to Chicago, and then from Chicago to London, Ontario, uh, then they moved to Detroit. My dad and Ted and another brother, uh, Bear Levin, uh, opened a law firm here after they went to law school. They, uh, I know my dad, uh, and I think most of them probably represented uh, immigrants, mainly Jewish immigrants probably. They never charged any immigrant for their immigration work. My dad uh, also was an uh, honorary counsel from Honduras. He spoke uh, Spanish, and uh, he actually taught Spanish during World War II to Navy flyers. My Uncle Ted was a federal judge appointed uh, by um, President Truman, and um, he became a very famous federal judge. My mother uh, was born into a Jewish family, a traditional Jewish family, came from the old country. Um, her dad was a peddler who had a uh, horse and a buggy and was out in the farm country around Birmingham at that time selling spools and threads and things that you could, peddlers could sell to farmers. And he saved his pennies, literally. And he bought some, he bought a store in Birmingham, Michigan called Levin Sun Department Store. Her maiden name was Levin Sun. Uh, she had three brothers. She was probably the only Jew ever born in the city of Birmingham, which was then a village, by the way, when she was born. Because even though there's a lot of Jews there now, uh, she was born in her house. And uh, her brothers were born in a hospital. So we kind of jokingly uh, think about her as the only Jew that was ever born literally in the city of Birmingham. The riot came in 1967. Um, I had a lot of friends in the African-American community and um, they and a number of newspaper pundits urged me to run for the city council. The city needed to be healed. They thought because of my, my um, work uh, both uh, with the Civil Rights Commission and with indigents that uh, I could make a contribution. In 1973, um, Coleman Young was elected, became the first African-American elected mayor of Detroit. And he and I got along real well. We, we differed on some fundamental issues, mainly involving uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch arguing for their own powers, their own jurisdiction. We had always lived in the city, uh, my wife and I, and uh, we had always lived and raised our kids in the city, and as it became more and more African American, uh, we stayed with the city. We, we never left the city. never thought I was going to get involved in a running for office. I obviously ran for the city council and won. Uh, the second time, because I got the most votes in the city, I became the council president. So now I'm on the city council, and I decided to retire. Eight years kind of wore me out. Um, and uh, a number of people urged me to run for the Senate. And I was exploring it, actually. I had a fairly well-known name in my, on my own because I was city council president, the largest media market in Detroit in the state. And so as I was exploring whether to run, Griffin, who had maybe six months or a year earlier said he was not going to run for re-election, he was tired. And after he said he was tired, he missed a whole lot of votes. So anyways, I, I was exploring whether I should run for the 
sent it. I was sleeping on a bed of a friend in the Upper Peninsula, and Griffin announced that he changed his mind. That did it for me. I had a tough primary where I was significantly outspent in the primary and had a tough campaign against Griffin. Uh, won in a very close race against the incumbent. And Jack Lausma, who was an astronaut, a real nice guy, he, he won their primary. By the way, there was a lot of antagonism to Griffin in the Republican Party when he changed because a lot of people had counted on him not running. What happened was that Lausma started his literature with his physical de description. And the description ran six foot three, 190 pounds, blonde hair and blue eyes. Now, my staff was saying, uh-oh, there's a, there's a signal in there. And I said, believe me, there isn't. He's a nice guy. He's not trying to imply that he's not Jewish, and I am. That's not Jack Lausma. So let's have fun with it. And so uh, a couple weeks later, after his literature came out, I said, well, now my opponent has put out this literature with his physical characteristics, physical appearance. And, and I said, we've decided to fight back. And the way we're going to do it, we, we threw, we're throwing away all of our literature. We're going to start off all of our new literature with uh, my physical appearance, plump, balding, and disheveled. And crowds loved it. Um, because people really like authenticity and they like humor in a campaign. You know, my feelings about wealthy people who try to avoid paying taxes or profitable corporations avoiding taxes using all kinds of gimmicks and loopholes all stems, I think, from actually Jewish values. My father always said, if, if we're lucky enough to live in this country, never complain about paying taxes. I mean, that was, that was an article of faith. If you're making a good living, count your blessings, pay taxes. And, you know, the, the tax avoidance schemes which were used, the Enron, tax avoidance schemes, the, the way in which uh, Apple transferred its property to Ireland, the, the other, these are the most profitable companies in the world. And for them to be able to get away without paying taxes just shifts the burden to other people, to middle income people. And everybody ought to contribute to it, who can afford to. And I remember having the head of Apple in front of me at, at our permanent subcommittee on investigations. And I want to give uh, John McCain some real credit, by the way, because he was my senior Republican who stood up with me against these tax avoidance schemes. But anyway, so the head of Apple comes in front of us, and I, I held up my, my iPhone. I said, you know, this is a great product. So what? That doesn't mean you shouldn't pay taxes. We're talking about not your products. It's, it's the fact you ought to contribute to the society which you're part of and help support you on the way up. I really had very close relationships with my ranking Republicans, one of whom was John McCain. And John McCain and I were really close friends, totally trusted each other, and differed from time to time. We worked out our differences. John Warner, who was a more moderate Republican, and I are probably best, I was probably my best friend in the Senate, a Republican. Another one, uh, Tom Coburn, Dr. Coburn, who was a very conservative Republican from Oklahoma, who attacked some of my earmarks, by the way, was a, is a very good man. He's a very conservative man, but he's very, he's straight. He, he, he uh, is honest. He's got integrity. He was a good friend of mine. He's on the board of the Levin Center. And he and I would disagree probably 80% of the time philosophically. But he was, he agreed with me on the work of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Go after the facts, wherever they take you. 
um, go there. Our city's really coming back. I always believed it would someday. Uh, always fought for it when I could, either on city council or in the Senate. Uh, but I uh, never thought I'd see it coming back this strong. It's an amazing phenomenon for me and very, very heartwarming to see it come back. And it's the young people who are over, who have sort of um, gotten over some hang-ups about uh, gender, about race, all our hang-ups about either not gone, but there, we've made progress in this country. We, we got rid of don't ask, don't tell in the Armed Services Committee. So I worked out something with McCain. You talk about compromise and filibuster. The compromise was, John, if you'll I'll take it out of the bill. I was chairman of the committee. I'll take it out of the bill, providing you will join in overriding the filibuster, beating the filibuster on a separate standalone bill. And he said, you got a deal. And he honored it. So we got rid of don't ask, don't tell, but we did it on a separate bill, not in the defense bill, okay? And by the way, I watched as Obama signed the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell on a monitor outside of the Senate while I was getting the defense bill itself passed. And Obama said when he was signing the repeal of this bad law, which we thought was progress at the time, by the way, but it was a bad law, Obama said, where's Levin? He said, oh, I know where he is. He said, no weeds somewhere fighting for something on the Senate floor. And I watched him say that. And I think Carl Levin's still working. Uh, but I want to add Carl Levin. <laughs> 